This is the lab in Cambridge, England, where in 1953, Crick and Watson worked on the molecular structure of DNA. Their decoding of its double helix won them the Nobel Prize. 60 years on, their discoveries have brought extensive change to medical research, not least in the establishment of the NIHR Bioresource. In this programme, I'm going to look at exactly what the NIHR Bioresource is how it works and what it means for everyone involved. Not just the pharmaceutical industry, medical researchers, doctors and clinicians, but also the network of local bioresource centres themselves. Quite simply, the National Bioresource is a resource of thousands of volunteers willing to be involved in medical research. But as we'll discover, that simple description doesn't do justice to the tremendous change in medical research and treatment it represents. This is what David Cameron, British Prime Minister, had to say on the subject. By unlocking the power of DNA data, the NHS will lead the global race for better tests, better drugs and above all, better care. We are turning an important scientific breakthrough into a potentially life-saving reality for NHS patients across the country. If we get this right, we could transform how we diagnose and treat our most complex diseases, not only here, but across the world, while enabling our best scientists to discover the next wonder drug or breakthrough technology. But what role does the NIHR bioresource have to play in this global context and the future, not just of medical research, but also of the British economy? We all know that research historically was done by small teams, but research, particularly in the clinical arena with patients, has changed. It's become a team game working with platforms. You could call the NIHR bioresource a platform. But to do this, we need everyone to collaborate. And what the bioresource is doing is getting all the biomedical research centres of the NIHR working effectively together. The Cambridge Bioresource has been established within the NIHR Cambridge Biomedical Research Centre during the last five years. And during that time, it became apparent that there were other similar resources in biomedical research centres and units across the country. If we could bring those together and harmonise them, we would have a much more powerful resource that would provide researchers in both academia and industry with very rapid access to volunteers for research. It's much quicker, it's much more efficient. That money that the researchers had in their budget to do the research then doesn't have to be factored into the recruitment because the recruitment's already done, so all that money can then be put into the research. You're doing the job once and getting as many people involved as you can. And then down the line, you're being specific and saying, OK, of the people we've got, who suits what study? The National Bioresource provides researchers with the opportunity to select individuals by genotype of interest to their study and by phenotype too, if required. Ed Bullmore is head of research for pharmaceutical industry leader, GSK. Can you give me an example of where the bioresource approach has been particularly effective? Here in Cambridge, we recently did a study where we looked at genetic variation in a particular gene called BDNF. Uh, now, we wanted to find two groups of individuals with uh, a MET allele or a VAL allele in this particular gene. Using National Bar Resource, we were able to find those 60 individuals very quickly and for very much less cost. And that was a study that was completed you know, on time and on budget last year. So that's a concrete example where we've been able to use bioresource to really expedite uh, a study that would have been quite challenging, I think, in terms of timeline and budget otherwise. We have to spread the net much wider, and that's the rationale behind a national bioresource in disease. It'll allow us, for a given disease, to get a big enough patient cohort 
for meaningful, to allow meaningful genetic assessment. There's no way I could have done this study without having the National Bioresource. You know, one thing we know is that there's increasing numbers of studies that have found whole new numbers of genetic variants associated with diseases, which we really can't follow up in disease populations. And the Bioresource has really revolutionised the actual functional understanding of what these genetic variants are doing. The beauty of the bioresource is that we're doing it once and we're doing it for everybody. And now that we've done it in, in Cambridge, to now say, OK, the next challenge is, can we roll that out and set it up across other centres? It's a national network for England with its headquarters in Cambridge. It involves six new centres similar to Cambridge, based around major medical research centres. And each will set up its own local bioresource, but will share the analysed data, communicating and collaborating together to facilitate the research in the most efficient way. The six new bioresources are based at the NIHR Biomedical Research Unit at Leicester and at the Biomedical Research Centres in Oxford and London, where there are four centres, namely at Imperial College, King's College and Guy's and St. Thomas Hospitals, King's College, the South London and Moseley Hospitals, and University College London and University College London Hospital. They are based within some of the most outstanding NHS and university partnerships in the country, and they were chosen because they all have established patient recruitment programmes. The centres receive substantial funding from the National Institute for Health Research to translate fundamental biomedical research into clinical therapies that benefit patients and improve healthcare. Each of the centres is recruiting cohorts of healthy volunteers and patients who've provided samples and agreed to be recalled by genotype and phenotype to participate in clinical research. There are plans to extend the network beyond the setup phase. So, following the establishment of the National Bioresource in 2012, how are the local centres getting on? Well, I'm visiting a few to find out more, starting here at UCL in London. Dean, and tell me a bit about your research and how it benefits from National Bioresource. Well, it's immensely rewarding to be working within a research framework that's based on the NHS because we have access to data from around the UK, uh, in, in my particular case, HIV. Um, and this puts us at an advantage compared to any researchers in the world, whether it is elsewhere in Europe or the United States. What are the particular strengths here at Leicester and how are they relevant to the Bioresource project? So, so our interest are in heart disease, and in particular in identifying genes that affect your risk of getting heart disease. So we made quite a lot of progress in identifying these genes. And the next step in translating this into improved treatments for patients is to study subgroups of patients who carry healthy people and patients who carry different versions of the genes. And this involves having a pool of people like in the NIHR bar resource, which we can call on to come and help us in so that we can understand the mechanisms by which these genes affect risk. The main asset is that it fast tracks the research because we have volunteers who are already signed up, we have access to their DNA, we can select them on the basis of either genotype or phenotypic data that we have, which means that a study can start pretty much straight away rather than the old system of going to recruit patients out in the community before you could even begin the study. The patient plus maybe their relatives who come in with them or friends sign a simple piece of paper and donate their blood and their DNA for our bioresource, fill in a few details, and this way we'll quickly build up thousands of patients and uh, controls who can be used in a whole variety of studies, not only for us, but also to combine with the rest of the country. I think it's the, the way forward, I certainly to make the public feel more involved and of course to be able to pull on disease cohorts and from other bioresources is essential. So without having this um, communication, it would, it, the research probably would be a lot slower. Most psychiatry and neurology disorders are under-researched. Um, there is currently a lack of clinical trials uh, in the area and most pharma companies' pipelines in the area are rather thin. We hope that the National Bioresource will provide a way to design new and better clinical trials. We urgently need new treatments to help us 
in the management of people with schizophrenia to help them live better lives. And the bioresource help, will help us design new clinical trials, new types of trials to be able to achieve that. One of the nice things about the, about the bioresource is that it's a resource of people and not of samples. The patients and their families uh, see taking part in the bioresource as a sort of investment in the future. Well, we are delighted to be part of the bioresource because this clearly gives a broader and a deeper uh, collection of phenotypic and genotypic data on individuals uh, in, in the different centres. And we would see that our bioresource would very much contribute to that, that wider aim. So one of the studies that we have, uh, we, we have a, a, a lot of data collection is a so-called airwave study of the UK police forces. So we're rather excited about the opportunity of including the airwave study in the, in the bioresource. Why is collaboration so important in this project? There are two main reasons. One is that some of the variants that we study are very rare, and therefore we need an enough of a pool of people, such as we can get through the NIGR bioresource, to identify enough subjects to study. Yeah. And the other is that you know, not one centre has all the relevant skills to study these people. Yeah. So by col collaborating between the centres, we can make sure that we can use the best test to study these, precious, you know, these, these patients who are very precious. The ability to screen through the very large data sets and have the centres collaborating is absolutely essential. We, well, we'll fail without it. And so I think we'll look back on this, I hope, in 15, 20 years' time and see it was the start of a new way of thinking about how to investigate disease, getting hold of disease mechanisms, and obviously, most importantly, starting to influence the management and therapies of the disease. The local centres are all eager and excited to be part of the NIHR bioresource. It really opens up the research possibilities by providing opportunities to collaborate, sharing skills and expertise, making it easier to target and research treatments for rare diseases, and making it possible to undertake difficult trials, trials that in the past could not have been run because of a shortage of the correct type of volunteers. If you've got the right focus and actually it's all about the patients, the reason why we're doing research is ultimately to benefit patients. It's important that researchers share their knowledge, share their expertise. You know, that's the only way that we're going to really drive research forward. This is how the process works. I can sign up to join Bioresource as a volunteer in a variety of ways. I may receive a leaflet, see a display in my local community, or visit a mobile recruitment unit or I may be waiting at a clinic to see my consultant and be approached by a bioresource nurse. As an interested volunteer, I'm invited along to a national bioresource clinic. Here, I provide informed consent and donate a small sample of my blood or saliva from which my DNA is isolated. A nurse looks after me and later my details are entered into a secure volunteer database of personal and medical information. When my samples get to the lab for genotyping processing, my identity is hidden. There's no route to my personal data. When researchers request volunteers with a particular genotype, samples from the National Bioresource database are selected for genotyping. The National Bioresource is then sent the list of barcodes. The Bioresource team then look at additional criteria about my phenotype and use this to determine the final list of volunteers who are eligible to be invited. The other volunteers and I are then contacted to invite us to participate in a clinical study or trial. Researchers only receive information of relevance to their study, a small proportion of my genotype data. Volunteer data is safe, secure and utterly confidential. One of the brilliant things about the NIHR bioresource is that while it offers researchers completely customisable groups of volunteers classified by both their genotype and phenotype, it also makes their data completely anonymous through a process called pseudo anonymization Because it's all anonymised as well, you're known as a number. So even when you give your medical history, you know, you needn't worry at all about it. And um, Yes, they're very reassuring too, um, in as much as if there's something you really don't want to take part in, you don't have to. Um, you know, you can always say, I'm, I'm not happy to do that, or I don't want to fill in this questionnaire, and that's fine. 
As I've been told again and again as I've travelled around the country, the National Bioresource is all about people. People who are interested in medical research and willing to volunteer to participate in medical research studies. This is what some of the volunteers have to say. To follow up, I've actually taken part in one of the studies um, and that was online, so I did it at home in my own time. It was really easy to do, so I mean, I would definitely say to people, take part. One of the good things comes up when you see a study reported on the news in a few months or a year or so down the line, you can think, oh, I was part of that, I, I helped that study. And uh, that you can reply by text message. So yeah, in that's the letter amazing, it says, if you yeah. want to take part, text this number, it's great. You don't even need to mm -hmm. fill in a form or put an envelope in the post, it's, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. At the end of the meeting, someone stood up and said, would you like to join the uh, buy a resource? I thought, that sounds a good idea. And there was a free pen. So I sent an email, and they, because they were asking for volunteers to go on the lay panel, and then the idea is that we can report back to the volunteers so they know how their work is benefiting science. It seems to me that the beauty of the National Bioresource is that it offers a uniquely transparent, collaborative and highly cost-effective approach to research and clinical trials. It speeds up the whole process of translational research, delivering patient treatments from the bench to the bedside. The NIHR Bioresource focuses on value, the value of people contributing to medical research. The NIHR Bioresource holds just enough materials and can provide fresh new samples from volunteers only when needed and only to very exact requirements, saving time, money and resources. The NIHR Bioresource offers a far more cost-effective way for industry to conduct research and trials. It's not about holding masses of samples in refrigerated stores on an industrial scale. The National Bioresource does away with the need for expensive storage facilities and enables researchers to focus on research and to focus funding on patient benefit, not technical facilities. Its impact will be as significant on medical research as those discoveries by Crick and Watson over 60 years ago that led to its creation. I think the National Bioresource is the next generation of biomedical research. Mm -hmm.